will uh, pray uh, after ser after service. But um, uh, and so thank you, thank you for those things. Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, and open the book of Second Kings. Let me tell you, I'm uh, oh, hoping that next week we're going to begin into a series of messages. I think we'll be ready to get started next week. Um, I, say, I would say broadly on the subject of apologetics, I've said that to you already, uh, but we're going to begin to talk about, you know, how, uh, how, do we know, uh, how do we know what we know about God and is God real? And uh, just how we kind of deal with those sorts of things from the Word of God. So we're not going to try to do this simply from uh, from philosophy, although you know there's philosophy involved in everything. We're going to try to uh, to learn about uh, about defending, really declaring our faith from the Word of God. In fact, I would argue that there are that there are from almost the beginning of Scripture through the end of Scripture what I call apologetic encounters. Okay where uh, they're either proving who God is, proving that Jesus is God, uh, all of those things. So think about, uh, think about uh, the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel. That is all about who God is. And he's standing on one side saying this is who God is. And really all of the nation of Israel to the greatest extent is standing on the other side. And what he does is give God an opportunity, lifts him up, and God proves who he is. And, the, and you find these things all throughout the Word of God. So, uh, Lord willing, next Wednesday night we'll start on that, and, um, and it'll go for a little while, and I think it will be a help to you. I want you to remember this. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, apologetics is not about debating, and it's not about winning arguments. It is about winning people to Christ. It is about letting the Word remove the obstacles to faith and belief in people's life. And do we have to deal with some things? Yeah, we do. But our objective is not to be like, oh, those are the people that can out-argue everybody. Our objective is to be the people who can give a reason to everyone that asketh, the answer to everyone that asketh the reason for the hope that lieth in us. Amen? So 2 Kings tonight, chapter 21, when you find your place, if you'd stand with me uh, in honor of the Word of God. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about impact tonight, and uh, beginning in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 21, the Bible says this, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal, and made a grove as did uh, Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord uh, said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven and in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with uh, familiar spirits and wizards. Uh, he uh, wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image in the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe if they only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearken not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh the king of Judah hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, uh, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of, my, remnant of mine inheritance, and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done that which was evil in my sight, and have provoked me to anger since the day that their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day." 
Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Beside his sin wherewith he made uh, Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did in his sin that he sinned are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house, in the garden of Uzzah, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. Let's pray together tonight. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for our time once again. I pray, Lord, that just this really very simple uh, message would uh, stick in our hearts and minds tonight. That it would uh, that it would arrest us, and that we would examine our life carefully according to your word. That we may remain in the land. That we might, Lord, live in the place of intimacy and closeness with you because of the lives that we choose to live based upon truth. Help us, Father, I pray. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing tonight, and please be seated. So... <clears throat> Manasseh is one of the kind of boy kings, that's what I call them, starts to reign when he was 12 years old, and he's impacted, of course, by everything that went before him. At the end of this record, the record is pretty clear that Manasseh, if he's not the most wicked king of Judah, he's in a close tie for it. He was a wicked man almost all of his life. There was a turn at the end of his life to a degree when he was ultimately carried away captive and, and uh, bound in the pit uh, of the Assyrian king. But Manasseh was a man who, from the very beginning, refused to seek the Lord. Now, I, I want to uh, not hold Manasseh out as someone that lives in a vacuum, but as someone who is, has been impacted by those who went before and I want to do that for this reason, because everybody leaves an impact on somebody every day. That, uh, that every day of your life, you're impacting someone. Parents, you're impacting children, you're impact your children, you're impacting people when you go out to work, when you go to the store, when you uh, talk on the telephone, and sometimes uh, if you're talking to Medicare, it's very hard to have a good impact sometimes, but, um, but uh, we're impacting every day. And Manasseh, of course, he was the, uh, the son of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah kind of had a, a, a different career, if you will, or reign as a king. Hezekiah really did a lot of good things. Hezekiah led a revival and, uh, in the nation and just did a lot of good things. But at the end of his life, he turned the other direction. And he really began, instead of uh, leaning on God and trusting God and, and uh, giving his life to the Lord he, uh, and letting God use it as he had, uh, he really began to be self-centered and walk away from the Lord. And he had a pretty negative impact on his son. In fact, if you take just a second with me and go back to chapter 20, it's maybe on the same page or the page behind. But And look at uh, verse number 14. We'll just read a few verses here. It says, Then Isaiah the prophet, uh, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence uh, came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They, pardon me, come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, all the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now listen to this. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Hezekiah had a, a terrible, ultimately, impact on his son Manasseh. Now, I don't believe for one second that that's the entire reason that Manasseh headed off the way he did when he began, began to reign. But clearly, if he began to reign when he was 12 years old and Man uh, Hezekiah made this turn during the latter years of his life, uh, Manasseh did not see the righteous father that Hezekiah had been before. Manasseh saw the father that was chasing after the things of the world. My wife says this all the time. 
Starting's easy. Finishing matters. It's true, isn't it? And Hezekiah didn't finish well. And because of that, there clearly is an impact on Manasseh. And Manasseh began his, his ministry, if you will, his reign as king, rejecting God's rule and seeking after the world with all of his heart, precisely the way his father ended his reign, by resisting what God wanted and seeking after the world. And I'm only telling you all of that for a couple of brief moments to make sure that you understand tonight that everybody has an impact on somebody every day. I, I remember when I learned that I had impacted my little brother, not on purpose, just by living. And it wasn't because I beat him up often, okay, because I was a good big brother mostly. But I remember going to my, grandmom, my grandmother's house and spending the night, and my little brother was there, and I don't know what had gone on, but I kind of didn't want him around me at that moment. He was way younger than me, and I was super cool. You know how that goes. Parted my hair in the middle. I was super cool. And um, my grandmother sat me down after David had, had gone to bed and said, you need to know something, that that kid worships the way you walk. And I thought, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. But she was right. Not because there's something special, but because everybody impacts somebody every day. And whatever impact you leave is what leaves a mark from your life on their life. And so just know this, that it happens. And Manasseh, he also had impact, and his impact was devastating. And, uh, and you know, you're making this impact. He made this impact really with every decision. I want you to know this about impact, that impact is not made so much in the big things of life, but impact is made in the routine things of life. It's in the living of life. It's in the responses. It's in the, in the look on your faith, face. It's, a, it's, it's just in all of the routine things. It's much like the glory of God. Do you remember how Paul would write, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. The glory of God doesn't come out of the big moments in our life. The glory of God comes out of the routine moments in our life as much as it does anywhere else. And our impact on others, which we're impacting somebody all of the time, it comes out of the routine of our life. And if you take Manasseh's routine in this chapter very briefly tonight, here's what you find out. That he made an impact on the nation of Israel, or Judah, pardon me, that was devastating. Look at a few things that he did. We'll just kind of survey quickly. In verse 3, he, uh, he built again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and reared up altars from all, and made a grove as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and ser served them. The nation of Judah had not gone as far down the road towards institutionalized idolatry as the northern kingdom had. That's why they were carried away uh, into captivity quicker. But Manasseh comes along after Hezekiah had uh, tried to remove much of that, his father, in the early years of his life. And, and Manasseh really reinstituted or reinstitutionalized idolatry in the nation of Israel. And so he begins to put in place all of the opportunities and the places and the rituals to, to worship idolatry. And he had an impact when he did it. Not only did he uh, lift up false gods, but he diminished the true and living God. In verses 4 and 5 of this chapter, it says, And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And so uh, he begins to treat the true and living God as just another among the gods. And so he takes the house of God, which was consecrated unto God, and he brings into it the worship of the planets, of the sun and the moon and the stars. Not at all uncommon in the ancient Near East, but doesn't belong at all in Israel. And he did that. He just diminished God. You do understand that God never shares the throne with anything or anybody else. You and I need to make sure we grip, grip that. Because sometimes we think we're sharing, that we've got a part God-honoring life and a part not God-honoring life or something. I'm here to tell you that the moment you turn to this, God gives the throne to that. Really, you give the throne to that. God does not share his glory and God does not share his sovereignty and God does not share his rule in our life. 
No man can serve two masters. That's what the Word of God says. And Manasseh did that. And so when you do that, you just make God as if he were another God amongst all of the false gods. And that's what Manasseh did. And of course, that had a devastating impact on the people. Verse 6, 7, and 8 say that he provoked God. And he did that, according to verse 6, by making his son pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizard and wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord, verse 6, to provoke him to anger. I mean, Manasseh was brazen about kind of standing in front of God with his chest puffed out and saying, look, you can call yourself whatever you want to, but I'll decide who's God around here. And he, and he, just, uh, he just provoked God to anger. Now, th this was no mystery. Israel knew this. It was a part of their covenant. In fact, here was the, the covenant. If I can put it all, and I've, I've said it before, so you know it already, but here was the covenant. If you obey these things that are the words of the covenant, we call them the law of Moses. The law of Moses is really the terms of the covenant. The Mosaic covenant is a conditional covenant. And the Mosaic covenant is not about everlasting life. The Mosaic Covenant is about being in the land of Canaan. And the terms of it are, if you don't obey me, and that includes worshiping no other God, right, then you get put out of the land. Those are the terms of the covenant. So it's no mystery that when he began to make his sons pass through the fire, right, offering them involved in the, the wicked worship of Molech or sometimes called by other names in different places, offering them as sacrifices uh, sometimes to, to false gods and by observing times and using enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards and, old wizards. and oh, by the way, it was no mystery that every one of these things was addressed by God in the terms of the covenant. So unlike much of our life in 2024, their life was not generic. God was very specific. He is with us too, but we're not always with him. And he said these things. I mean, come on, read Exodus and Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy in particular, and you'll find how specific God is in these things. And the very things that Manasseh did, the, the law of Moses, the terms of the covenant say these things provoke God to anger. So this wasn't something that he was like, ah, I knew something was wrong with this. These things were deliberate. He deliberately pro provoked God to anger. If you go down to uh, verse number 16 real quickly, we'll come back to a couple. It says this, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So you take all of those things, all of the idolatry, all of the diminishing of God, all of the provoking God to anger, and you add on top of that that he was a vicious, cruel, bloody king. That he, he spilt much innocent blood on top of, it says, besides the things that he made Judah to sin in diminishing the Lord. I'm just telling you this, is that in all of this he had an impact you will say, well, of course, preacher. I mean, those are big, huge things. Well, they are big, huge things. But in their day, they were routine things. They were the routine acts of worship. They weren't supposed to be, but they were. And oftentimes, it's the routines that are outside of the direction of God that we build and allow in our life that have the greatest impact, not for good, on other people around us. And Manasseh had that. If you go back to uh, uh, verse number nine with me, it says, but they hearken not, verse eight maybe, uh, where God says, listen, you know, he'd set a graven images. Uh, God said, I I've said that I won't move them out of this land, verse nine, but they hearken not. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, the king of Judah, hath done these abominations, hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah uh, also to sin with his idols, therefore saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. 
And so Manasseh uh, did all of these things, all of these works. He had made them all routine, living in the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem at that time. You really wouldn't be able to recognize anything that belonged to the true and living God. But all these things had become the norms of life. I've been studying a lot on ethics and morals as a part of what I'm studying for apologetics, and we've talked about some of it before. But I just want you to know that they had diminished it to the place. Morals ultimately are those things that are commonly accepted by an individual as a group as right or wrong. Ethics are the unchangeables. Morals are things that men set and should be set upon an unchanging ethic. But when they all agree on them, then the, the act of them is no longer an immoral act within their culture. I'm not saying before God, I'm not saying before you and I, but within their culture. Beheading believers in Saudi Arabia is not an immoral act in Saudi Arabia. No, 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 I'm not letting them off the hook, don't misunderstanding me. Before the true and living God, it is both unethical and therefore immoral on God's terms. Amen? But in their place, it's commendable. It's routine. It's expected. It's normal. You say, don't they weep over it? Some do, but many don't because it's become the norm of the land. That's what's going on with Manasseh. These people weren't sitting in their house every day going, I can't believe he did that. It was just a part of life to the point where God said, as you read, that I'm going to have to empty Jerusalem and they're going to be carried away into captivity by the Babylonians. And really that was all, I, I like the verse we read. Um, it says that Manasseh seduced them to do more. That was his impact. His impact on their life was an impact of seducing to sin. Proverbs 26 addresses that. And it says that the way of the righteous is pleasant or upright. But the way of the wicked is a seducer to sin. You understand seduction, right? What is seduction? It's enticing, okay. What's that? Coercion, yeah. It is a trick. Seduction is trying to get somebody to do the wrong thing by convincing them that it's the right or popular or whatever thing, isn't it? To get them on your side. You know, the, the book of Proverbs ultimately says about the strange woman that she's a seducer. Do you know that you seldom, if ever, hear the word seduction with anything good? Like, you know, they seduced, uh, I don't know, they seduced him to become their preacher. In fact, let's not even use those words together anymore, okay? <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you that it really doesn't happen that way, does it? I mean, you really don't hear it. Maybe, maybe it's there. I don't know what it'd be. I mean, uh, I don't know how you'd use it in a good way. But Manasseh did that. He seduced them to more wickedness. And of course, he had some authority behind it, which makes that seduction even more powerful, doesn't it? And you could probably stop here, and I'm not going to, but just for a second, and you could talk about how, how much we need to beware and stand strong in our day because, friend, I will tell you this, we are being seduced from every angle to, to wickedness and unrighteousness in this nation. We spill innocent blood. We do that. And we're being seduced to accept wrong is right and right is wrong. And all seducers mock those who don't go along and make fun of them as being somehow out of the norm because they are resetting the mores or the norms of our, of our culture into things that are absolutely wicked against God. That's the day we live in. And they're having an impact. They're having an impact. So Manasseh impacted them. Everybody's having an impact every day. And just like we see in Manasseh's life, you're making an impact with every decision and every act you make. And don't be deceived. The impact of your life, again, is not just in the bell ringers, but it's in the absolute routines of your life. And you're impacting. Let me tell you the third thing I want you to know about impact tonight from Manasseh's life. And that is this, that your impact endures. <laughs> It affects others based upon your relationship with God, 
Had Manasseh been right with God, his impact would have been towards God. Because Manasseh was not right with God, his impact was away. Your impact affects others because of your relationship with God. I'll just tell you this, if you're impacting people to things that don't belong in their life, the root of that problem is what's going on between in you, in your heart, between you and God, because it's not what it ought to be. But then I'd say this, and we have to just a few minutes, but your impact endures beyond the moment. You know, sometimes we recognize maybe when we're, we've had a bad impact or we've done something that would leave a mark, and we, and we apologize for it maybe and say, let's just move on. And, and yeah, I mean, I believe in biblical forgiveness. I don't believe in just word forgiveness. I trust you don't either. I believe in changed lives through repentance and the word of God. I do. I believe all of that. I just know this, that the, that the dent you leave in somebody's life doesn't just automatically go away. That the impact you're having in the routine, just in the way you do things. In fact, I would say that the, the greatest impact is in the routine, as I've already said, and it's that impact which leaves the deep, deeper dent, the bigger, the bigger place in someone's life. When it's an event out of character or out of place, I think it's a lot easier for people to sort of uh, put off that, in that uh, li- lasting impact. But when it's, when it's an impact that comes from the routine of our life being different than what it ought to be, I'm telling you, that leaves deep scar or mark in people's lives. And it endures. It goes on and on sometimes. Manasseh's did. I want to show you a couple of verses very quickly. Even though they make changes, the, you make changes, and Manasseh did, your impact still goes on. Look forward in chapter 23 of 2 Kings with me very quickly this evening in verse number 26. You can read this several times in Scripture. We'll look at a couple. In uh, chapter 23 of 2 Kings in verse 26, the Bible says this, notwithstanding, right, Uh, There were things that were done to be put right. There's a new king. There are things being restored. All of that is good. Uh, In fact, the verse before 25 says, And like unto him there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul. This is not Manasseh, right? This is Josiah. Uh, And uh, all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him, notwithstanding. In spite of all of that, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, listen here, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. you got to understand that this is 40 years or so after the death of Manasseh. This is after the end of life turn of Manasseh. This is after Manasseh standing up to some degree and saying, I was wrong, we need to follow the true God. 40 years later, his impact is still having a directional effect on the nation of Judah. And God has not turned. And look at one more with me. If you would, chapter 24, uh, verse number 3. <clears throat> Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah. This is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, coming up against, uh, against Judah and Israel or and uh, Jerusalem. Right? And also, I'm sorry, surely at the commandment of the Lord, verse 3, came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight. Why? For the sins of Manasseh. For the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. And also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Yep. Everyone's making an impact every day. And your impact is made in your decisions and your choices and your actions that you make routinely throughout your days. And your impact, uh, your impact, it's based upon the impact you're having is determined really by your relationship with God. But the impact that you're having will continue to affect those who come behind you. It endures. So I think we should agree with this. That us being deliberate about the sort of impact we have on others, not just family, everybody we encounter. Us being careful and deliberate about the impact we have on others should be very important to us. Because you see, the banner of Christ flies over our life. 
And when our routine impacts others differently than him, you understand that it diminishes his glory in your life. There's, there's just no negotiating it. You don't really get to decide if God gets glory in your life. You can live a life intended to give God glory. God decides when he's glorified. And all of the things that we allow in our life that wouldn't glorify him don't somehow get balanced out or weighed over by the things that might glorify him. It is interesting how we believe that we are not saved by works at all, and yet somehow we think we can balance out the impact of both good and bad in our life. Impact is had by everyone all the time. It's in the routines of life. It's based upon your relationship with God. And it endures. Now, you could step back from this and you could say, well, how bad could it be? I mean, after all, these are the covenant people of God. They are, they are in a covenant with God based upon the terms of the Mosaic Covenant and still setting on Mount Moriah, sort of the apex of the city at that point of Jerusalem, is the temple to the living God. It's been absolutely defiled, but it's still there. But God intended and even commanded Israel to have an impact for him on the nations around them. Missions as we understand it is kind of a New Testament commission, but missions at its core is what God has always sent His people to do, to shine the light and His glory so that people might come to Him. You could be converted to Israel and into the covenant people of God in the Old Testament. And that was their mission. The problem was, I mean, if we just read this and take it at face value, is that they no longer lived as if they were servants of the Most High God. They had given themselves to other gods. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to beat up on them because I know, and you know if you're honest, how simple it is to do this. But they had given themselves to other gods. Have you ever been a mile deep into something you wish you'd never touched with your toes? Well, preacher, I don't understand how that happened to me. It just happened. I woke up one day and there I was in the middle of whatever. No, you didn't just wake up and it happened. You made a series of choices along the way and every one of them impacted somebody else. And the problem is, right at the very beginning, you gave yourself away to another master. That master may just be you. It most often is. I want what I want and I want it now. But here are these people who the whole world believes in to be the people of the true and living God to some degree. They know their testimony. They know what God has done in years gone by. They know, in fact, when all of this takes place, when Jerusalem is turned upside down and emptied as a bowl, uh, people will walk by, according to the prophet, and they'll wag their heads and say, tisk, 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 whatever happened to these people and their God? Because they understood that their God was unique and that they had a different kind of relationship with him and were supposed to have. But they had given themselves to someone else. Another God, another master. So that brings me to the lesson. The impact you make in your life. Some people would say, well, if I was Manasseh, I'd turn over a new leaf. I'd be a better man. Well, that's a good idea. I think he tried that to some extent at the end of his life after he was in the pit. Pit will get your attention, by the way. The problem is your impact is not really based upon who you are. Don't miss this. It's based upon whose you are. Your impact is based upon your master more than it really is upon you. No, no, I'm not taking your responsibility out of it because with every work of grace God does, we have some responsibility, don't we? Put on, therefore, put off, therefore, the old man after the flesh. Put on, therefore, the new. Yes, we have grace 
to do that. Yes, we have God's uh, strength and help to help us along the way. I'm just telling you that we're the ones who've got to unbutton the old life and put it off. I'm talking about in the living. I'm not talking in our standing before God. I'm talking about in the way we live our lives. We've got to unbutton the things. We've got to say no to the devil and resist him and yes to God, and then he'll flee from us. We've got to work with the, with the setting aside of habits that shouldn't be in our life, thought patterns that shouldn't be in our life, relationships that don't belong there. We've got to do all of that. But none of that gets done just simply because we turn over a new leaf. You can turn over a new leaf until the cows come home. Sooner or later, you're going to end up back where you began. What has to change is your master. And that's the lesson tonight. You and I are impacting people every day. And it's not just because we don't shake our fist at the stoplight like other road rage drivers. But it's in every routine action we do. And we're either, well, we are always influencing, influencing them toward our master. Every influence is toward your master. And either your master is Christ, for one is your master, the gospel wrote, Luke, I believe, even Christ. And either our impact because of our relationship with him, because he is our master, is towards him, or our, relation, our impact is away from him because we're leading them to another master. You probably sometimes get tired of me telling you this is about the heart. This is about surrendering our lives. This is about pouring ourselves out and letting Christ be Lord. This is about biblical discipleship where we die to ourselves and follow him, where we go where he says, do what he says, how he says, why he says, because he's Lord. I'm just here to tell you tonight that the impact of your life will exist. It will endure and the kind of impact it is has everything to do with whose you are, your master. And we better begin to practice some things we see in Scripture, I think. Things like this. I die daily. I protest by your rejoicings. I die daily. Why did he say that? What did he mean? He meant this. I die daily to myself. Jesus said it. This is the criteria of a disciple, that you would uh, come after me, that you would pick up your cross daily and follow me. And you know this. I've told you, I've told you probably too many times, but picking up the cross is not carrying some burden around. It is death. It is dead. It is dying to self. That means when you die to self that you no longer respond to the inputs of your own desires. That would make you the master. When you die to yourself and Jesus is the master, he now gets to be the one who calls the shots because you respond to that. Is everybody here with me tonight? And your impact. It is real, it is present, and it is happening. But it will be based upon or toward who your master is. Well, I'm a pretty good person, preacher. I believe that of all of you. Well, except one, but I'll let you figure who out who that is later. I believe that of all of you. <clears throat> but it's not who you are. It's whose you are. Amen? Let's deliberately be servants of Christ with him as master and we as nothing. Right? Father, I thank you for our time. I pray, God, you'd bless your word. I pray, God, that you'd help us, that you'd give us grace, that you'd give us even courage. You'd give us desire to truly be your disciples, to truly, Lord, have an impact that is toward you through your dear son. That we would, we would, fix, the, we would fix the aiming point, the compass of our life on having an impact toward you you dear father and we would reject any other course for our life help us i pray in jesus name amen you have your prayer lists